This is History in the Haversack, coming to you from the halls of the New England Civil War Museum, where we connect the people of today with the memories and humanity of the people of the American Civil War. I'm Kara Kaminsky, Collections Director. And I'm Matt Vallier, Programming Director. And I'm Dan Hayden, Executive Director. And also joining us today is Chris Biggs from the Ellington Historical Society. Hi, everyone. You know him. He's been on before. And what are we going to be talking about today, Matt? All right. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Sergeant Benjamin Hurst. Uh, and Sergeant Benjamin Hurst was in Company D of the 14th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry during the Civil War. Now, Ben and his brothers have a very interesting history even before the Civil War. Their family had emigrated from the United Kingdom, but growing up, they had been involved in the textile industry in Great Britain. Growing up in that environment, they were allowed uh, to go to school. They were allowed to learn how to read, write, and, and all those kind of basic necessities. And when they immigrated in 1847, they originally settled in the Delaware area. Uh, and then and it's a few years later, they moved to uh, the brothers, Ben, his brother, Joe, and the brother, John, moved to the Vernon Rockville area. Now, during the Civil War, Ben... Uh, writes to his wife, Sarah, very frequently, uh, and he is constantly giving her updates on his well-being, his brother's well-beings, and just the ins and outs of army life that really give us a really good picture of what the average Civil War experience was for these individuals. So today we're going to dive into just a few of the letters that Ben had written home to his wife, Sarah, kind of break those down and dissect them a little bit. The first one we'll start off with is actually in the post-war era. Uh, and I think it's really important because this has been looking back before they had experienced any battles, before they had really experienced any hardships of soldiering. This passage is as follows. I have often wondered what our ideas of soldiering were at the time we left Hartford, and just imagine how I must have looked as I clambered up the companion ladder to the boat's deck with a sergeant's sword dangling between my legs, my haversack and pockets filled with a miscellaneous assortment of literature, grub, patent medicine, fluid extracts, etc., a knapsack on my back filled with shirts, drawers, stockings, collars, cuffs, combs, and brushes, with a pious book or two to read when we got settled down in camp. That's really kind of important to look at even before you get into the wartime letters because he's looking back on it after he's experienced all this stuff. Uh, what what do you guys think about that passage? I think what he's trying to get at is this is that he's talking about the very beginning of his service. And so they didn't know mm -hmm. any better about all the marching that they were about to do. And he's carrying all this stuff with him. I know mm -hmm. there's a famous... Uh, uh, sketch uh, or engraving of the the recruit and it's a picture of the the guy carrying like everything under the sun and an extra pair of boots hanging off of his knapsack and then it's the next one skips over to the the veteran and he's basically just got like a a, a gum blanket tied around his his shoulder and you know th just his basic accoutrements there so after they've marched a few miles yeah and you start to see all the stuff pile up on the side of the road right and that's one of those little tropes that uh probably most military conflicts has a, a few stories like that of the uh of the soldiers throwing extra stuff away that they don't want to to carry i think it's really interesting too because you know you they have this innocence about them you know, these soldiers, uh, I mean, even though Ben is well within his adult years, I mean, he's not old by any means, but he's not necessarily a younger guy. But these guys, they have an innocence about them. You know, they're excited to be in the uniform. They're excited to get down there. And their vision of what war is, you know, likely came from a book or an etching in a newspaper or, or something like that. In those illustrations of war, it all looks so glorious and exciting and you know the flag flying high with the soldiers with their chest puffed out with the bayonets charged and the officers on their horses you know waving their sabers around you know that that's the kind of the narrative 
of of what war is to these guys before they've experienced it. It's a difference of their conceived notion of what life is like, right? So at the they're coming from the perspective of being at a home. And mm-hmm. uh, even though they were outdoor people, right? They were outdoors a lot of the time and, you know, but they still had all of their stuff at a quote unquote home, whether that was their own property, whether they were renting an apartment. So everything was around them and, oh, I need this in order to operate, right? And they don't know yet <laughs> how little they actually do need to continue serving in, in, in this capacity. So being a mill worker like he was, or a farmer or day laborer where most other uh, citizen soldiers were, had no bearing on what it was like to be on their feet on the march in camp, even in winter quarters when they're mm-hmm. building log cabins there, how little they actually needed in order to survive. I do like his inclusion of um, bringing the two books along with him because it kind of shows the expected amount of time they would have thought uh, they'd have there when we have seen what their daily schedules looked like. You're up, you're doing drills almost the whole day, you're marching. There's not much downtime. And in that downtime, they end up writing their letters and just trying to escape by telling stories around the campfire and stuff. So it, it's interesting to see what he packed and and how that kind of shows what he was expecting. And that passage even goes on to mention, you know, cowhide boots and, and all this other stuff, you know, these creature comforts, and they're soon going to be without all of this stuff for a long period of time, <laughs> whether they liked it or not. But that brings us to our next passage. And I'm quoting this stuff from the Boys of Rockville uh, book by uh, Robert L. B., who transcribed all these letters and, and um, put them in this wonderful book uh, that I use almost on the daily. <laughs> so this next one is on uh, page 18. If you're following along, uh, we're going to be at the bottom. And just to set up this passage here, the 14th Connecticut hasn't seen any battle yet. Uh, they've seen the traces of battles. Uh, they're getting into the Maryland campaign in the early fall, late summer, 1862. And this letter is dated Monday, September 15th, 1862. Uh, so right around the time of the Battle of South Mountain. So Monday, September 15th, 1862. Awoke on the battlefield of yesterday and after getting some coffee, began to look around. Soon saw war without romance. There was dead men lying around everywhere, some with their heads shattered to pieces, others with their bowels protruding while others had lost arms and legs. What my feelings were, I cannot describe, but I hope to God never to see such another sight again. About 10 o'clock, we were drawn up in line and on the roadside and had the pleasure of seeing Generals McClellan and Burnside ride past us. We then marched in the direction of Keatesville. About 3 p.m. passed through Boonesboro and saw a lot of Reb prisoners brought in. We passed several lots coming in during the day. So I think the important, the main important thing about this is that they're really seeing what war is. They're seeing what the carnage of war is and possibly what could happen to them and, and their comrades. Is this the first passage where you see his reaction to war? Yeah, pretty much, um, because up until that point, they hadn't really done all that much. They had seen some traces of it while they were marching through Frederick. Mainly, it's it's Confederate prisoners that they interact with. But this is really the first taste of like real war because they're on the battlefield. When they had gotten to that part of the field the night before... Uh, and they had bed down, it was too dark, and they couldn't see anything around them that that had been on the field at the same time. So as the sun is coming up and the men are starting to stir, they're getting their coffees going, and then they cannot actually like see what is around them. I think that's a, really a, a shock, and I think you really catch the emotion when he says, soon saw war without romance. So all of that stuff that we had just mentioned – you know, those glorious scenes in newspapers or, or books or etchings and artwork kind of has gone out the window because now they're seeing exactly what it is that war is. 
just to remind you, they haven't been under really any fire yet. They're they're close to the front line, but they're not on the front line quite yet. They're not on the battle line quite yet. So yeah, and they're they're a month old at this point. So the 14th Connecticut right. was mustered in in August in Connecticut. You know, and it takes a week to get down there. Uh, you know, so after a couple of weeks of organizing and training, and then getting down there, they they just got onto the scene now it's not the first time that they had heard about this right because the war had been going on right. for a year at this point yep but this was the first time that anybody had seen it because of, of the of these guys because these guys were all new recruits you know where we kind of see on the news what's happening around the world and all the different conflicts that are going on over in ukraine you know over in africa you know the the civil wars that are going on we can see images of that but back then they only heard about it at that point matthew brady hadn't really taken all those photographs yet that he uh, would be famous for pretty soon he hadn't put on that big display in new york city so people hasn't haven't been exposed to what actually happens on the battlefield because that what they're thinking is kind of like what most people think of now when they're watching a civil war reenactment it's that dramatic oh i am slain and i fall down dead right in, in a very shakespearean way but what he's describing that he's seeing is something that you know. nobody knew they were going to see and it's so visceral that and this is this is like you said this is before they're actually experiencing it. They probably hear these things going on in the background, you know, going through South Mountain. You know, they've seen the the results of this. And this is also uh, what's notable is this is a journal entry of his. This isn't a letter. So this is him yep. writing down for himself what he's seeing. Because a lot of times we see in their letters that they sanitize these things in the Victorian way that they did, you know, to not – offend the sensibilities of the people who are going to be reading these letters. He wrote this for himself. So he was being at, as descriptive as he personally wanted to be. So a little bit after this, I'll just kind of speed up to the next one. The next uh, journal entry that we're going to get into is on uh, page 78. And this is to his wife, Sarah, on January 11th, 1863. So the 14th Connecticut, they're going to fight at um, Antietam. They're going to fight at the Sunken Lane with the Second Corps. They're going to get through that, uh, that pretty traumatic experience. And there is a friend of his, Thomas Wilkie. He's also in Company D. And he is also an English immigrant. He's also a veteran of the Crimean War. But he's wounded in the 14th advance going towards the Sunken Lane. Uh, they haven't even fired the shots yet, but he gets wounded. And so Ben puts him over by a tree and says, I'm going to come back for you. Ben comes back after, after the 14th has gone in, after the battle has left that part of the field, and he's going to go back and look for Thomas, and he's not there. Uh, he later learns that he was killed. Um, and in another letter, this, this death of his friend bothered him so much uh, that he promised he would never leave another comrade on the field uh, again. And that'll play into this letter that we're going to read in January 1863. After Antietam, the 14th stays on the field for a couple days. They help clean up the battlefield, rest up, and then they're marched down to the area of Harper's Ferry. I think they're camped out on Bolivar Heights um, a few weeks after the Battle of Antietam. Um, mind you, all of their gear, their knapsacks and stuff like that, are back in the area of Washington. And there are arrangements that are made to go and get it, but nothing really happens. So it's like weeks until the 14th has proper cold weather clothing, like their great coats and stuff like that. Their creature comforts, they don't necessarily even have like their tents with them. So they're just kind of camping out in the open here. And a lot of the guys actually come down with colds or sickness related to the cold, but they're going to power through that. Then they end up at the Battle of Fredericksburg. So um, if you're a Civil War aficionado, you probably already know a great deal about Fredericksburg. It's another huge Eastern battle of the American Civil War. But the Second Corps is going to be involved in one of the more bloody parts of it. The Second Corps launches several frontal attacks on a stone wall that is being 
fortified by the Confederate troops. And so these guys, these Union lines are just going over open plain up these rolling hills up to Maurice Heights, and they are cut down in their thousands. And the 14th Connecticut is one of these units that is going to advance in this charge. In this attack, Ben Hurst and his friends, they, they don't have a company officer at this time. Everybody's either sick or they've resigned. Their highest ranking officer officer uh, is Sergeant Frank Stoughton um, of Company D. So they don't even have like an actual officer leading their company. They are, you know, it is the highest ranking person is a sergeant. And in that attack, Ben Hurst's friend, Oliver Dart, is wounded uh, right in the mouth. Ben Hurst is going to take Oliver Dart down to like the closest like clearing station, basically. And in the attack, Ben Hurst tells uh, another one of the men to let Frank Stoughton know that he will be with him shortly, but he needs to attend to Oliver Dart. And I think this is him in his mind going back to his friend Thomas who he was not with. So, and he kind of blames himself for Thomas's death. He stays with Oliver Dart and then the battle happens. And then they fall back into winter quarters across the Rappahannock. Also in the battle of Fredericksburg, Benjamin Hearst's brother, Joe is wounded in the legs in this battle. So uh, this is already one of the brothers wounded uh, in the 14th service. One last thing, and uh, this is going to play into this letter quite a bit. Um, there's another soldier in Company D. His name is Albert Town. Uh, he shares the same name as his father. So Albert Town Jr. is one of the soldiers in the 14th. And uh, Albert Town Jr. is going to be uh, killed uh, at Fredericksburg. And his body uh, goes unidentified, actually, until Chamberlain, the famous Chamberlain, uh, of the 20th Maine uh, finds his body on the Fredericksburg battlefield. And the way he was identified by Chamberlain was uh, Albert Town took out his Bible as he was passing away, and it had his name written in the inside cover. Without any more context, we'll get into this. January 11th, 1863. Dear Sarah, I received your long-expected letter last night and was much pleased to see the success you had in doing your business in Washington and that you got home all right and found things to your satisfaction. And now for what Mr. Town says about me in connection with Brigham. I showed Frank Stoughton your letter and he will write to his wife that he knows about the matter. For myself, I can laugh at all the yarns that can be told about me. I done just as I meant to do under certain circumstances. At Antietam, I just moved poor Wilkie and left him to his fate. After his death, I blamed myself for not taking him to the hospital and swore never to leave another man as I did him. And when I saw the same men at Fredericksburg playing the game of Antietam, I went in too, but with no idea of leaving the fight. When Private Oliver Dart and Simmons, Corporal John Simmons, were wounded, I saw Sergeant Brigham and Corporal Hyde and Private Newell take hold of Simmons to take him off. I jumped to my feet and took hold of Dart, calling Hyde from Simmons to assist me. We took them to the hospital, where I ordered Hyde and Newell back to the regiment to tell Stoughton I would be with them in a few minutes. The doctor looked at Dart and Simmons. It was me asked Brigham to come with me to join the regiment. He said John wanted him to stay by him. Then Dart said he wanted me to stay with him a little while. I done so because I just then heard of our regiment coming down the street having been relieved. I then made myself easy attending to Dart as Frank Stoughton knew where he could find me at any moment, day or night. After our Joe was brought into hospital, Brigham came to our John and me and said the regiment was a little ways down the street. I asked Brigham to go and see Frank Stoughton and tell him where I was, and also to tell him that if the regiment moved, I wanted to go with it. He said he would do it, but did it not. Our John can witness this. Stoughton came to me soon after that and told me to stick by dart. I then was satisfied that Brigham had told him as I asked him to, but Frank says Brigham done no such thing, but that he asked him if he could go not join him. He, Brigham, said John Simmons wanted him and went to the hospital. I have since asked Frank why he did not ask me to join them. He said because he thought I was ready to go at any moment and he could depend on me. I want you to show Jerry Rose this letter and tell him that any man that says I did not do my duty at Fredericksburg is a liar. 
I have never been excused from duty for sickness, although I have often been worse than whose place I had to take. And tell him if I was the only commissioned officer in a company, I would not go to a doctor to get excused on the morning of a battle. Also tell him if the war is conducted in this, in this way very much longer, I shall be able to play Yankee as well as soldier. What Brigham writes home, I care nothing about. He was as brave at Fredericksburg as at Antietam. A few days after you left here, I wrote you an account of the Battle of Fredericksburg. I hope you got it, as it is as near correct as I can make it. I think this is a really important letter because it kind of shows the fragility of a man's honor during this time period. So Albert Town Jr.'s father came down to Fredericksburg to take his son's body home, but he couldn't find him. He wasn't identified at the time. Ben Hurst was told that Albert Town Sr. was going around saying that Ben Hurst did not do his duty at Fredericksburg because he stayed there with the wounded. I think this is really important because this has been sticking up for himself and he's telling his wife like, no, no, I, I did my duty and I said I was going to be there. I think this is kind of really getting into the deeper mind of, of Ben too, because, um, you know, he, he explicitly explains that he didn't want to just leave his friend on the battlefield, especially when, or at the hospital, even though, you know, even when Oliver was saying like, I need you to just stay with me for a little while, you know, you have those, those two conflicting scenarios going on because he wants to be, with the regiment in the fight, but he also doesn't want to leave his friend behind. Well, this is an interesting one because when you look at the position that he was in, he was sergeant, right? And so um, he was in line with everybody else. And the sergeant's job, amongst many other things, is more about trying to help keep order within the line itself, right? Because the officers are yelling commands from behind the line, for the most part, um, it's because you know they not they're not carrying muskets, so they have to get out of the way of the guys carrying muskets. So the officers are behind them, telling them to keep up their fire, to advance, and things like that. So the sergeants are the really the ones within the line itself, trying to maintain some sort of order. Plus, they're the, they got to be the guys that take over if one of the three officers in a company get get hit which happens very often with line officers. So what, what he did was he he left the line and carried uh, Oliver Dart back. That's not usually what the sergeant does, right? So if anything else, it would have been having a, a private or somebody else or calling for a stretcher. Like, I know it's a tough thing to do in the middle of battle and they're all laying down and everything like that, but... That's it's curious that he did that. Uh, it's also from the perspective of somebody sitting in a comfortable chair right now talking about it, and right. not necessarily <laughs> in a very, you know, it's December thirteenth and it's freezing outside. Everybody's wearing great coats. They're lying down in the mud, and they're watching all sorts of things happen in front of them because they're they're waiting to go in. And when Oliver Dart was hit, they're laying down basically. They're waiting in line for. Um, for their chance to go in. So on one hand, you could say, you know, you question the the judgment and the, you know, was he under a lot of stress? Was this, you know, because, but at the other hand, it's like, well, they've already been through Antietam. They've, they've been battle tested. They know what's happening here. He knows his job. It's just interesting. Like, why did, why did he do that? Did he have that connection to Oliver that he felt personally responsible for him? Because when they saw him, I mean, the right. quote is like, poor Oliver Dart looked like his face had been taken away with a cleaver, right? I mean, he was in yeah. bad shape. And you, right. it's not like a guy who got, oh, I, my arm hurts or my leg hurts. Let me help you back to the front. It it right. didn't look good. He was, that was essentially a mortal wound. Yeah, I mean, and this is something too that I think Ben wrestles with too, because he, he briefly mentions that he did as other soldiers were doing. And, you know, these guys who weren't wounded when he complains about this uh, after Antietam, he sees men who aren't wounded flock to one wounded man. And you have like six guys unwounded, taking off one guy off the field, you know, obviously because they're like, ah, uh, that 
guy is kind of my ticket out of the firing line right now. And nobody is, I'm not going to get in trouble. And I, I think that's something interesting about this letter too, because he's defending his stance when a couple months or a few months previous, he was complaining about those individuals leaving the line for one wounded man and not coming back to the line. You find tonally that he's starting to change how he's writing about his civil war experience based on where he is and in, 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 at this point in the campaign and how he reflects on these moments. I mean, I would say definitely um, he, he's changing in his way because if we rewind to before Antietam, you know, it, it's, it's, all kind of waiting to go into the action. I'm looking through the book and this letter that we're discussing today right here is January 11th, 1863. And if you look backwards through the previous letters before that, that he's writing home from his wife, um, he writes on December 30th, to her a letter um really talking about um some of the things that have just happened including the battle he mentions oliver dart poor oliver dart as he rolled over he looked as though his whole face was shot away men were being killed and wounded all along the line where he lay and we could do nothing in return uh he doesn't mention anything about going back and bringing oliver dart back so right. it's only when he's had this uh, particular, you know, what he perceived as a slight to him from somebody else through back channels, because everybody knew each other, right? Because Company D was from the area, yeah. so they were all writing home about this one way or the other. Uh, of course, you have the Albert Town uh, situation. Right. And well, and on uh, January 9th, they still haven't found uh albert town jr yet they haven't found his body uh yeah. in in the letter at the end he says p.s we have heard nothing from albert town jr as yet i visited most of the hospital graveyards this side of the river but i've not seen his name there are scores of graves that are marked unknown he may fill one of these it could be that you know they were waiting to go in and they weren't you know yeah. well we could be here for a while so why don't i take the opportunity now before we start moving so that, that could be another right uh reason but you know here there's that victorian sense of honor right but he doesn't want anybody at home thinking that he did anything less than his duty and this rumor going around uh by albert town senior is really affecting him and He's asking the other guys in the company to write home and say, no, like this, what, this is what happened. And it's about keeping that image. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying about, you know, the, the difference between the journal entries and the letters, because in those journal entries, you know, he's not writing that for anybody else other than himself. So he can be very honest and descriptive and really how, he was feeling to a degree in there, but in the letters, he's going to leave out some of those details. And I think this is a situation where he left out the the details about moving Oliver Dard in this whole situation. But now that it's coming into question, he's like, OK, well, we're not going to pull any punches here. This is what happened as how I remember it. So, Chris, in um, in partial answer to your your question there. Um, if we look forward through the 14th Connecticut's service going forward, the next chance essentially that he has to reprove himself is that is at Chancellorsville, but they didn't get engaged very deeply at Chancellorsville there. It's really only Gettysburg in July hmm. where it's the next real big action where they're under fire. And so what you do see in his letters in the hospital after Gettysburg because he, he didn't get shot, but a, uh, a shell or a bullet, something hit a, a stone wall that they were up against at the angle. 
and the rock smashed into the back of his shoulder uh, to the point where they had to drag him away to the field hospital. That was during Pickett's charge. You can kind of tell that he's like, he feels a sense of vindication that not only did he reprove that he could, you know, stand through battle, but he also got a wound, which was the badge of honor here in in terms of Victorian uh, service in the military at that time. All right, well, we got a busy fall coming up here at the museum. We have we have a few pretty interesting speakers coming up on November 7th, Lisa Samia, who is a award-winning poet and an author, and she wrote um, a book that she's going to be speaking about, The Nameless and the Faceless of the Civil War. She's given this presentation at uh, Civil War Battlefields and National Parks uh, down in D.C., so she's, she's a pretty well-known speaker and really focuses in on the average soldier during the Civil War. And then finally, on December 5th, we have Drew Gruber, who is the executive director of Civil War Trails, the all the signs down south that uh, all of us Civil War geeks rubberneck to every time we drive down the road and point out, oh, there's another sign right there. So he'll be speaking um, in this uh, very energetic uh, way that he does his presentations on the Williamsburg campaign, because he's also a, a noted historian himself. Um, following up on his presentation that he gave for us last year, which is about the Yorktown campaign. So pretty busy uh, fourth quarter here coming up. These are all on uh, Thursday nights. Usually it's the first Thursday of the month uh, that coincides with our Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War uh, camp meetings. Uh, we at Alden Skinner Camp number 45 do meet first Thursday of the month, but even larger sense here for our our wider audience is we have departments for the sons all around the United States. If you have ancestry of a, a Union soldier who served honorably during the Civil War or Union sailor, Union Marine, Revenue Cutter Service, you are automatically eligible for uh, for membership in the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. And you know what? Even if you're not of Civil War hereditary, well, if you're deeply in, interested in the Civil War and really passionate about preserving the memory and telling the stories of the people of the Civil War era, well, there's also membership for you as well. The, the other way that you can help support the museum is by becoming a friend, friends of the New England Civil War Museum. Um, we rely on our friends to be able to help us do all of these speaking engagements to put on all of our new narrations and exhibits at the, in the Civil War Museum. This is uh, one of the most important parts of being able to create new things and to continue telling the story of the people of the past here in the Civil War. So if you go to newenglandcivilwarmuseum.com, all that information is there. We'd love to have you join us in one way or the other. And thank you to our audience for your continued support. I promise we'll be back on a regular monthly posting schedule, and you can find all our episodes on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And a big thanks to uh, Jacob Bates in his rendition of Billy in the Low Ground off of the American Battlefield Trust album uh, that he collaborated with in the youth leadership program and thank you again and we'll see you on the next one 